on March 10, 1876, that Alexander Graham Bell first succeeded in transmitting speech over the crude assemblage of reed, wire, and magnets, which was the first telephone. The story of the years then, and of the part the telephone has played in the growth of our nation, could hold in many ways. But one way to tell it is in terms of three people. Of Jim Larson, who is the hope of tomorrow. Of Helen Larson, who is the spirit of today. And of Paul Kendall, who is the fulfillment of yesterday. Fifty years, so long and yet so short a time. And often at the end, it seems the beginning was only yesterday. strong for my years. Well, how you know? And your name? Kendall. Paul Kendall? Well, how do you do, Mr. Kate? Mike Chatty. How do you... Yeah. Now, all right, son, now run along. I'm busy. I wasn't sure I wanted a job anyway. You, you what? Oh, I got an uncle who owns the biggest blacksmith shop in town. He thinks I'm crazy not to take a job with him. He says there'll always be blacksmiths with the telephone. That's just for rich men and gabby women. Nothing but a gadget. Well, he says that, does he? Well, you listen to me, Mr. Kendall. You've got an uncle who's a fool, and you can quote me. You're talking to a man who helps install one of the very first switchboards there ever was. Back in New Haven in 78. Who helped string the first line between cities. From Boston to Providence. A man who's seen what this telephone has done for the country already in 25 years. A gadget in it! Well, that's what he said. Well, you tell that weasel with an uncle of yours that there's already a million telephones in this country. And I'll wager anything he wants to name that there'll be ten times before I die. Anyway, before you die, you tell him that. I'll tell him. Yes. Oh, 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 don't mind me, sir. Just said I'm not an altogether mild man when I get right. I... Will you, you come on in here with me? I, I want to show you something. You, you've had a doubt put in your mind about the future of the telephone business. Here, here's a man in Charleston, South Carolina, say, who wants to buy it. And here's a man in San Francisco, California, who wants to sell. Think what it'll be. The Charleston fellow will pick up the telephone and say, Hello, give me San Francisco. San Francisco? Uh, uh, never mind. Well, any, anyway, you get the idea. The telephone is improving every day. It's the research that does it. The telephone was born in research. And it'll keep on getting better the same way. And once those research fellows find the right repeater, you'll be able to hear not just to Chicago like now, but to Omaha, Seattle, or wherever we can pack a pole or string a wire. And that, the both of us need to see. I'm beginning to believe you're right, Mr. Cassidy. Kirk, you can stake your life on it that I am, my boy. Yes. Keep your eye on that bell, son. And mark my words. And as this nation grows, the telephone will grow with it. And it'll play a strong part in that growth. In the future that lies ahead, beyond the belief of any man. Well, so long, Mr. Cassidy. Now I'm sorry I won't do for that job. Like I said, I learned fast. Get out there with the others. Get to work. Yes, sir. The year 1903 marked important milestones of human progress as man first found wings with the flight of the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. 
and a mechanic named Henry Ford organized a company which was to bear his name. But that same year, a young telephone lineman's helper found himself concerned with other things. Is your royal whistling highness aware that it's seven minutes past the lunch hour? I'm sorry, Mike. I was busy studying and I didn't realize. What do you got there? Here, let, let me see it. Principles of electric... Well, how long has this been going on? Over six months now. I've been going to school nights. Taking a course in electricity. Oh, you have, have you? What, what's this? The report card. Well, I suppose you know what this means, Mr. Kendall. What? It means you're fired for this gang. Providing, that is, I can get you a job in the office where you belong. In the engineer's office at headquarters. Now, close that mouth of yours and get to work. We've got wire to run. The years moved slowly there in the beginning of the century, but already there were signs of things to come. New York's first subway was open. San Francisco rose from the ashes and debris of earthquake and fire. With the years, the network of telephone communication throughout America was continuing to grow. The long hoped for line from coast to coast was finally nearing reality. Oh, thanks for coming in. Hello, Mr. Barker. What do you think about that? It's a model of one of the new repeater units, isn't it? The one the lab fellows have been working on? Right, and it's worked out, Paul. Which means that the transcontinental line is no longer something we just talk about. Which brings me to why I sent for you. Seems that they need a few more engineers out there to help on the transcontinental project. Yes, sir. And? And it seems that one of the engineers in charge got hold of the name of a certain young man in this area. It was suggested to him by one of his construction bosses. Mike Cassidy. <laughs> How about it, Paul? Would you like to go? Would I? If it's all right with you, I'll leave yesterday. Well, I think we can compromise on the end of the week. Good luck, Paul, and to tell you the truth, I envy you. Oh. Yes, the plan to bridge the continent by wire had been long in the making. But at last, on June 17, 1914... What did I tell you, boy? There it is. Two-way bridge across the mile. Uh, you were a prophet, sure enough, Mike. And it's still only the beginning, Paul. Mark my words. Nothing in this world could stop us now. No, nothing could stop us now. And then just two weeks after the completion of that line, war in Europe. But within three short years, Europe's war was Europe's alone no longer. Over the nation, thousands of Paul Kendall's joined their fellow Americans in the first worldwide struggle against forces of tyranny. job of building a nation. A nation now come of age as a world power. A nation facing new and greater challenges in every facet of its economic life. No one can ever say we haven't a busy year ahead, Les. Well, all you fellas between you may have finished the war in Europe, but it's a cinch none of you returning to the telephone company are going to have much of a chance to relax. Who wants to? Just let me get out of this and back to my old job. Yeah. Oh, um, well, about that, Paul, I... I'm not so sure. You're not? Well, you see, Paul, it's... 
It's like this. Tony, haven't you finished with that yet? Oh, yes, Mr. Barker. All set, Mr. Snow. All set. Mr. Paul, with Harry Kale's retirement, I'm moving up. So in figuring the right man to take over my job here, well, what do you know? <laughs> Good luck with it, Paul. So watch it, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> the nation out of war and into the hectic years of the fabulous 20s. A time of dance marathon, a human flies and shakes and flatters, and the kind of a dance they call the child. But it was a time, too, of important progress everywhere in American life. The telephone network sped the messages of progress between factory and office, farm and store. As the nation grew, the telephone system kept moving ahead, erecting new buildings, making new cable and line installations, anticipating the expansion of towns and cities and rural communities. By 1927, the year a young man named Lindbergh blazed a sky trail over the Atlantic, scientists at the Bell Telephone Laboratories were demonstrating a new development in communication, a device called television. Can you see me clearly, Mr. Kendall? I can see you, and I still don't believe it. And that's why we like you men from the operating companies to get in here once in a while. Gives you a first-hand look at some of the things we're doing. It certainly does, and I'm floored. I'll leave you to Dr. Stevens now. I've got work to do. So long. So long. <laughs> Doctor, is this practical for general use? Well, that remains to be seen. So far, it's still in the experimental stage. Can it be used to send out entertainment, sports, news events, things like that? Well, that could very well be in time, but it's like the talking motion picture device we've developed that I showed you this morning. It's valuable and it's important, but it's still a byproduct of our real work. And I don't have to tell you what that is. <laughs> Improve the system. Exactly. Better telephone service for more people every year. And still some byproduct, I'd say. To us here, better service means constant research in many fields. Sometimes what looks impractical now may be a vital part of the telephone system later on. Back in 1915, 12 years ago, a single word was heard across the ocean. Just one word clearly heard. Yet this year, regular transatlantic telephone service was established, and you can talk across the ocean to London from any one of 18 million telephones in this country. 18 million. You know, Doctor, a great friend of mine once predicted 10 million telephones during my lifetime. And when old Mike said it, even that sounded fantastic. Mike? My first telephone boss, Mike Cassidy. Mike wrote me a while ago that he was retiring. Oh, not that there still isn't a Cassidy in the system carrying on for him. Oh? His daughter. Mike says he's just starting out as an operator in a small town out west, a place called Cedar Junction. I've often wondered what Helen Cassidy looks like. <laughs> if she's anything like her old man, she'll probably scare off every young fellow within a thousand miles. <laughs> well, put him on, will you? Hey, Catherine. Barney found Bill. Uh -huh. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, just in time, kiddo. Harry's going to take me to a dance over at Carlsville tonight. The board's all clear. No LDs, no. Hey, this is your first time along on the night shift, isn't it? Uh-huh. Scared, young chick? Oh, no. Maybe I am. Whatever. Here you are. My first time alone, I'm a sick be tired. Uh, nothing ever happened. Oh, that coffee. Keep it hot. Drink it if you get sleepy. I'll give you a ring when I get home. Just see how you're doing. You know, there's one call you'd be sure to get. Oh, Mr. Kleiner. He calls every single night of the year, exactly at 11.55. Find out what time it is. <laughs> Got eight cops in his house. Shut them all every night. Not asking why, he just does. <laughs> well, so long. Uh, Look, kiddo. There are going to be times when you'll think that running this board at night is the lonesomest job on earth. And when that happens, just remember the President of the United States is right there if you want to call him. Not that I recommend it, but you can. I mean, it, it's not just as though this board tied together all the farms around here and made everybody in the county a neighbor, but it brings the, the whole blessed world into the outside. I'll remember. Thanks, Teddy. 
Number, please. Give me Steve. Steve? Steve's diner. Oh, what? Yes, sir. Steve's diner, 135. Just want to be sure. Hey, you're a new operator, ain't you? Yes, sir. Well, what do you know? What's your name? Helen. Helen Cassidy, sir. Helen. Well, well. Good night, Helen. 11.55, eh? Well, it's 11.56 now. <laughs> so it is. Good night. Good night, sir. Right there? Yeah, right. Well, so let's go to the receiver and feel up inside her arm, up above the elbow, and press with your thumb. Keep pressing different places until you find the one that stops the bleeding. And hurry, Tommy. Press hard. I will. Please, Phil. Please, Phil. This is Cedar Junction. I can't raise the doctor here in town, and there's an emergency on Valley Road between here and there. I'll ring Dr. Sloan. That's fast thinking, honey. Who's hurt? It's a little girl. She's... Hello? I got it. I got it. I got it. Good. Now listen, honey. Have you got a handkerchief? Yeah, I got one. Well, tell your sister to hold her own arm a minute. And you tie the ends of the handkerchief together and slip it over her arm. And then with a pencil or, or a stick, it until the cloth is tight and put the turning part right where you were holding. You got it? Okay. Be right back. Read me. The doctor's on the line. Hello. Hello, this is Dr. Sloan. I heard what you told the boy, miss, and that's exactly right. Where is this station? At the Peyton Farm on Valley Road. Well, you tell the boy I'll be there in ten minutes. I'm on my way. Yes, sir. Still need Phil. Anything else you need? Well, I don't think so. Thank you, Bill. Hello, ma'am. I did it. You stopped it. She can hold it herself. Fine, Tommy. The doctor's on his way. He'll be there in ten minutes. If he isn't, you call me back. I will. Gee, thanks, ma'am. For a minute, I was almost scared. Well, I was almost scared myself, Tommy. For a minute. Are you okay now? Uh-huh. Bye, ma'am. Bye, Tommy. <laughs> Number, please. Hi, kiddo. Keep awake okay? Oh. Hello. I kept awake all right, Hattie. How's it been? Pretty quiet, huh? Mm, it hasn't been too quiet. Do you need help? No, sir. Good night, kid. Good night, Hattie. The fabulous 20s moved on. Every business and industry in America knew a growth and prosperity never before dreamed of. It was the golden age that was sure to last forever. <laughs> October 29, 1929, the end of an era and the beginning of a long ordeal. And by the early 30s in the office of just one telephone engineer. I don't get it, Paul. For two years, things have been terrible and getting worse. Businesses of all kinds going to the wall. Yet, now they talk about expansion. A whole new building with all dial equipment. What sense does it make? What's going to stop the depression, Joe, if anything can? 
keeping people at work, right? Well, that's why all over the telephone system, they've tried to keep every employee possible on the job. But another part of licking hard times is to keep right on investing in the future. This country will come back just as it always has. We of all people have got to believe that. Well, think about it like that, and I guess it does make sense. I'm sure that's why we got the word to go ahead with these plans. And Joe, stop worrying. And, of course, neither the hopes for the future nor the building for the future had been in vain. By the mid-30s, the nation's industry in every field was on the move again. New jobs. New dance. New planes. New ships. And once more, the telephone system kept pace with America's progress and helped it grow. The years that brought changes, too, to Helen Cassidy, now Helen Larson, married, widowed, and mother of a 10-year-old son. Long since moved from Cedar Junction to a larger city, Helen has learned that the spectacular calls are rare in an operator's experience, but the friendly, courteous service is the normal day-by-day -day routine. Hello, oh, Helen. You girls have met Mrs. Larson, our assistant chief operator. Indeed, we have. How are the girls getting along with the collective wood, Julie? Oh, fine. They're really doing beautifully. But that one still seems a little strange, though, after two years on a manual board in the other office. You'll soon get used to it. And you're in good hands to learn. Mrs. Larson, why all the bother to change the dial system anyway? Wouldn't it have been simpler to keep all the manual changes? It certainly would. But the way the calls are increasing without the dial system, Soon wouldn't be enough operators in America to take care of Even if it is, we need more girls than ever before. Oh, excuse me. I've got a heavy date waiting. Goodbye, girls. Bye. Bye. Heavy date? Mm. Well, that's all for today, girls. Tomorrow we'll study our court practice. <laughs> Mom has to first. I mean, I'll get it. You shouldn't be in here. <laughs> Never before had the American economy faced a greater challenge than in the days that immediately followed. How that challenge was to affect the nation's telephone system was soon established by conferences in Washington. And I know we're asking a lot, considering what you've already done in the preparedness period. But where we needed complete telephone equipment for 20 training camps then, now we'll need closer to 200. And for calling home facilities from those camps, we'll need special installations. That's all, to say nothing, field telephone, wire, radar, sonar, and everything, right on down the line. Quite an order, Colonel. It certainly is. And your Bell Lab facilities. You'll need even greater use of those than we've already had. Not only to develop new equipment, but to train technicians for all the services. What about the general production of telephone supply? On that, our estimate is that your Western Electric plants will have to more than double their present capacity within a matter of months. We even approach this schedule. Paul, your company's pretty typical. As its engineering representative, what have you got to say? Well, we'll still have to study these plans. But I've got a hunch the answer from all of us will be the same one that it's impossible. And we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Fantastic. Impossible. But somehow the job did get done thanks to hundreds of men like Paul Kendall and to thousands of other men in all phases of telephone work, research, manufacture, supply, and construction. And most certainly, all of this was not the work of men alone. Of vital importance, too, were the Janet Olsons, working to keep the regular service going at top efficiency. The Sophie Walenskys, meeting new challenges of service for military personnel. The Fran Nelson striving earnestly to meet the needs of people inconvenient for the shortage of home telephones. And thousands upon thousands of feminine hands working side by side with men on those vital assembly lines and telephone factories across the country. And on the far flung fronts of the global war, the equipment they produced was doing its part to aid the millions of men and women in uniform. 
radar, sonar, gun directors and range finders, field switchboard, and all the rest were all helping to bring closer that long-awaited day. For the second time in a generation, the joys of victory and the problems of conversion from war to an economy of peace. At Bell Laboratories, while still continuing certain research for future national security, scientists and technicians devised means to redesign military equipment for civilian use and continued development of other vital projects. At telephone manufacturing plants, Newly designed assembly lines turned out unprecedented quantities of new equipment with ever-increasing efficiency. And all over America, men and women in all branches of telephone companies were doing their part in a friendly, helpful way to maintain the highest possible standards of performance in a service that kept growing with even greater speed than ever before. Fifty years, so long, and yet so short a time. You might include some of these figures in your speech, Paul. Take just one of the outstanding growth periods, 1945 to 1950, for example. 43 million telephones in 1950, an increase of 15 million or more than 50% since 1945. Almost 100% since 1940. No, Harry, figures aren't the answer. Oh, they're impressive, sure. Even impress me. Like the number of people who actually own the telephone system. Somewhere around a million stockholders from all over America. Mighty important, that. So are the new developments. Things like people diaring their own long-distance calls. And the calls themselves. Carried hundreds at a time by radio. Or by a coaxial cable. Oh, mighty impressive, Harry. But not for a farewell speech. For that, a fellow needs... I still don't know. Thanks, anyway, for this, Harry. I'll just have to... Yes? Mr. Martin is here, Mr. Kendall. Oh, send him in. Know who this is, Harry? The grandson of my first boss. Just out of college and gone to work in the telephone research lab. His mother is the chief operator in one of the companies. They both have come on to do their demand. You've met the boy before? Never have. I'll see you later, boss. All right. Mr. Kendall? Come in, boy. Come in. Just stand there a minute. Let me look at you. So you think you can be a telephone man, do you? I hope so, Mr. Kendall. I seem to think there's a chance at Bell Lab. That's quite a place. No doubt in your mind about the future of the telephone, is there? Oh, none in the world. Why do you ask? Oh, I just remember something that was... No matter. How's your mother? Fine, thank you. She's arriving by plane this afternoon. She said that Mike never would have forgiven us if we weren't both here for your retirement dinner. Well, believe me, boy, I'm glad you are here. Me too, sir. Very glad. <laughs> yes, sir? You're Mike's grandson, all right. And I'm sure Paul knows, beyond any words of mine, how much all of us will miss him, and how much real affection follows him as he retires from the system. Now, Paul. I, I have a confession to make. I've been trying to figure out for days just how to say goodbye. 
I still don't know. What can a fella say after 50 years? I do know I'm proud all of you are here. I'm proud, too, that the daughter and grandson of Mike Cassidy, one of the best friends I ever had, are both here. Helen Larson and her son, Jim. Helen doesn't know it, but I've sort of checked up on her through the years. And she's got as fine a record as any chief operator in the system. Of course, I don't have to tell any of you about the importance of women to the telephone business. Outnumber us men two to one. And old as I am, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Jim. Well... He's about as new a telephone man as you could find anywhere. Just out of college a couple of weeks. So, of course, he knows more about the telephone than any of them. <laughs> but he's lucky, Jim is. He's joining one of the biggest teams in the world. At a time when, however astonishing, its achievements of the past may be. There's still only a promise of the things to come. Someone once told me that when I was even newer to the system than Jim is now. Keep your eye on that bell, Paul. Could take your life. As this nation grows, the telephone will grow along with it. Play a wondrous part in that growth. The future that lies ahead is beyond the belief of any. And now, as I say goodbye to all of you I've known and worked with for many years, I say hello to the Jim Larson and the Mary Angelo and the Harriet Flynn and all the young people, whatever their jobs, who are coming on. Tell the truth, I wish I had another 50 years to stay around and see what they accomplish. You see, now that the telephone is 75 years old, I've got the same hunch old Mike had when it was only 25. What lies ahead is beyond the belief of any man. For as great a part as the telephone has played in all our lives till now, It's still only the beginning.